Hello, and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac, and my goal is to bring to you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. We're continuing today with Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, and like usual for this book, trigger warning! The past was the worst, and they used words that should have never been used, but were back then, and are definitely not acceptable nowadays. I'm going to be ducking the audio so that they're bleeped, but if you are offended by this sort of language, uh, check out another book, like Frankenstein or Dracula, which are just fun for the whole family. <laughs> uh, if you want to support the show, do the things, like, comment, follow, um, review, podcast. I'm terrible at this. Let's get started before I ruin it and send everyone away. Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 21 It was after sun-up now, but we went right on and didn't tie up. The king and the duke turned out, by and by, looking pretty rusty. But after they jumped overboard and took a swim, it chippered them up a good deal. After breakfast, the king took a seat on the corner of the raft, and pulled off his boots and rolled up his breeches and let his legs dangle in the water, so as to be comfortable, and lit his pipe and went to get in his Romeo and Juliet by heart. When he'd got it pretty good, him and the duke began to practice it together. The duke had him learn it over and over again, how to say every speech, and made him sigh and put his hand on his heart, and after a while he said he'd done it pretty well. Only, he said, you mustn't bellow out Romeo that way, like a bull. You must say it soft and sick and languishy. So, Romeo, that's the idea. For Juliet's a dear, sweet, mere child of a girl, you know? and she don't bray like a jackass. Well, next day they got out a couple of long swords that the duke made out of oak laths and began to practice the sword fight. The duke called himself Richard the Third, and the way they laid on and pranced around the raft was grand to see. But by and by, the king fell overboard, and after that they took a rest and had a talk about all kinds of other adventures they'd had in other times along the river. After dinner, the duke says, Well, Captain, we want to make this a first-class show, you know. So I guess we'll add a little more to it. We want a little something to answer encores with, anyway. What's encores, Bilgewater? The Duke told him, and then he says, I'll answer it by doing the Highland Fling or the Sailor's Hornpipe. And you? Well, let me see. Oh, I've got it. You can do Hamlet's soliloquy. Hamlet's which? Hamlet's soliloquy, you know. The most celebrated thing in Shakespeare. It's sublime. Sublime. I haven't got it in the book. I've only got one volume. But I reckon I can piece it out from memory. I'll just walk up and down a minute and see if I can call it back from Recollections Vaults. So he went to marching up and down, thinking and frowning horrible every now and then. Then he would hoist up his eyebrows. Next, he would squeeze his hand on his forehead and stagger back and kind of moan. Next, he would sigh. And next, he'd let on to drop a tear. It was beautiful to see him. By and by, he got it. He told us to give attention. Then he strikes a most noble attitude, with one leg showed forward, and his arms stretched away up, and his head tilted back, looking up at the sky. Then he begins to rip and rave and grit his teeth. And after all that, all through his speech, he howled and spread around and swelled up his chest and just knocked the spots out of any acting ever I see before. This is the speech. I learned it. Easy enough while he was learning it to King. To be or not to be, that is the bare bodekin that makes calamity of so long life. For who would Farlock's bear to burning wood do come to Dunsinane? But that the fear of something after death murders the innocent sleep. Great nature's second course, and makes us rather sling the arrow of outrageous fortune than fly to others that we know not of. There's the respect must give us pause. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I would thou couldst, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the law's delay, and the quietus which pangs might take, in dead waste, and middle of the night, when churchyards yawn, in customary suits of solemn black, but the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveller returns breathes force contagion on the world. And thus the native hue of resolution, like the poor cat eye the adage, is sickled over with care, and all the clouds that lowered over our ass tops, with this regard, their currents turn awry, 
and lose the name of action. Tis consummation devoutly to be wished. But soft you, the fair failure. Ope thy not ponderous and marble jaw, but get thee to a nunnery. Go. Well, the old man, he liked that speech, and he mighty soon got it so he could do it first rate. It seemed like he was just born for it. And when he had his hand in and was excited, it was perfectly lovely the way he would rip and tear and rear up behind when he was getting it off. The first chance we got, the Duke had some show bills printed. And after that, for two or three days as we floating along, the raft was a most uncommon lively place, for there weren't nothing but sword fighting and rehearsing, as the Duke called it, going on all the time. One morning, when we was pretty well down the state of Arkansas, we come inside of a little one-horse town at a big bend. So we tied up about three-quarters of a mile above it in the mouth of a creek, which was shut like a tunnel by the cypress trees. And all of us but Jim took the canoe and went down there to see if there was any chance in that place for our show. We struck it mighty lucky. There was going to be a circus in there that afternoon, and the country people was already beginning to come in, in all kinds of shackly wagons and on horse. The circus would leave before night, so our show would have a pretty good chance. The Duke, he hired the courthouse, and we went around and stuck up our bills. They read like this. Shakespearean Revival. Wonderful attraction, for one night only. The world-renowned tragedians David Garrick the Younger of Dury Lane Theatre, London, and Edmund Keane the Elder of Royal Haymarket Theatre, Whitechapel, Puddin Lane, Piccadilly, London, and the Royal Continental Theatres in their sublime Shakespearean spectacle entitled The Balcony Scene in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, Mr. Garrick, Juliet, Mr. Keane, assisted by the whole strength of the company. New costumes, new scenery, new appointments. Also, the thrilling, masterly, and blood-curdling broadsword conflict in Richard III. Richard III, Mr. Garrick, Richmond, Mr. Keane. Also, by special request, Hamlet's immortal soliloquy by the illustrious Keane done by him 300 consecutive nights in Paris, for one night only, on account of imperative European engagements. Admission, 25 cents. Children and servants, 10 cents. Then we went loafing around the town. The stores and houses was most all shackly dried up frame concerns that had never been painted. They were set up there three or four foot above ground on stilts, so as to be out of reach of the water when the river was overflowed. The houses had little gardens around them, but they didn't seem to raise hardly anything in them but jimson weeds and sunflowers and ash piles and old curl-up boots and shoes and a piece of bottles and rags and played-out tinware. The fences was made out of different kinds of boards, nailed on at different times, and they leaned every which way, and had gates that didn't generally have but one hinge, a leather one. Some of the fences had been whitewashed some time or another, but the Duke said it was in Columbus time, like enough. There was generally hogs in the garden, and people driving them out. All the stores was along one street, and they had white, domestic awnings in front, and the country people hitched their horses to the awning posts. There was empty, dry good boxes under the awnings, and loafers roosting on them all day long, whittling them with their barlow knives, and chawing tobacco, and gaping and yawning and stretching, a mighty awnily lot. They generally had on yellow straw hats, most as white as an umbrella, but didn't wear no coats or waistcoats. And they called one another Bill and Buck and Hank and Joe and Andy and talked lazy and drawly and used considerable many cuss words. There was as many as one loafer leaning up against every awning post, and he most always had his hands in his breeches pockets, except when he fetched them out to lend a char tobacco or scratch. What a body was hearing amongst them all the time was, Give me a char tobacco, Hank. Hank got but one char left. That's Bill. Maybe Bill gives him a chaw. Maybe he lies and says he ain't got none. Some of them kind of loafers never has a cent in the world, not a chaw tobacco of their own. They get all their charring by borrowing. They says to a fella, I wish you'd lend me a chaw, Jack. I'll just this minute give Ben Thompson less chaw I had. Which is a lie, pretty much every time, but me don't fool nobody but a stranger. But Jack ain't no stranger. So he says, You don't give him a chaw, did you? So just sister's cat's grandmother. You pay me back the char you already borrowed off me, Laffy Bunker. Then I'll loan you one or two ton of it and won't charge you back no interest, neither. Well, I did pay you back some of it once. Yes, you did. About six char. You borrowed store tobacco and paid back n***er head. 
Store tobacco is flat, black plug. These fellas mostly chaw the natural leaves, twisted. When they borrow a chaw, they don't generally cut it off with a knife, but they set the plug between their teeth and gnaw with their teeth and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in two. Then, sometimes, the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says, sarcastic, Here, give me that chaw, and you take the plug. All the streets and lanes was just mud. There weren't nothing else but mud. Mud as black as tar, and not about a foot deep in some places, and two or three inches deep in all the places. The hogs loafed and grunted round everywhere. You'd see a muddy sow and a litter of pigs come lazing along down the street and wallop herself right down in the way where folks had to walk around her, and she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her ears whilst the pigs was milking her and looking as happy as if she was on a salary. And pretty soon, you'd hear a luffer sing out, Hi, Sue, boy! Sick him, Tigger! And away the sow would go, squealing most horrible, with a dog or two swinging to each ear, and three or four dozen more coming. And then you would see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight, and laugh at the fun, and look grateful for the noise. Then they'd settle back again, till there was a dog fight. They couldn't anything wake him up all over, and make them happy all over, like a dog fight unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him, or tying a tin pan to his tail and seeing him run himself to death. On the riverfront, some of the houses were sticking out over the bank, and they was bowed and bent and about ready to tumble in. The people had moved out of them. The bank was caved away under one corner of Smothers, and that corner was hanging over. People lived in them yet, but it was dangerous because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time, Sometimes a bed of land a quarter mile deep will start in and cave along and cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer. Such a town as that has always got to be moving back and back and back because the river is always gnawing at it. The nearer it got to noon that day, the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the street and more coming all the time. Families fetched their dinners with them from the country and eat them in the wagons. There was considerable whiskey drinking going on and I seen three fights. By and by, somebody sings out, Here comes old Boggs, in from the country for his little old money drunk. Here it comes, boys. All the loafers looked glad. I reckon they was used to having fun at old Boggs. One of them says, Wonder who he's gwine to chaw up this time. If he chawed up older men he's been gwine to chaw up the last twenty years, he'd have a considerable reputation now. Another one says, I wished old Boggs threatened me. Then I know I won't go and die for a thousand you. Boggs come a-tearing along on his horse, whooping and yelling like an engine, and singing out, Clear the track there. I'm on a wall path, and the price of coffins is a to raise. He was drunk and waving around in his saddle. He was over fifty year old and had a very red face. Everybody yelled at him and laughed at him and sassed him, and he sassed back and said he'd attend to them and lay them out in their regular turns. But he couldn't wait now, because he'd come to town to kill old Colonel Sheburn. And his motto was, Meat first and spoon vittles to top off on. He see me and rode up and says, Why'd you come from, boy? You prepared to die? And then he rode on. I was scared, but my man says, I don't mean nothing by it. He's always a carrying on like that when he's drunk. He's the best naturedest old fool in Arkansas. Never hurt nobody, drunk nor sober. Boggs rode up before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning and yells, Come out here, shipper. Come out and meet the man you swindle. You're the hound I'm after. I'm gonna have you too. And so he went on, calling Shepard and everything he could lay his tongue to, and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on. By and by, a proud-looking man, about fifty-five, and he was a heap the best-dressed man in that town, too, steps out of the store, and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come. He says to Box, mighty calm and slow, he says, I'm tired of this. I'll enjoy it till one o'clock. Till one o'clock, mind, no longer. If you open your mouth, against me only once after that time you can't travel so far but i will find you then he turns and goes in
The crowd looked mighty sober. Nobody stirred, and there weren't no more laughing. Boggs rode off, blackguard and chevron as loud as he could yell all down the street. And pretty soon back, he comes and stops before the store, still keeping it up. Some men crowded round him and tried to get him to shut up, but he wouldn't, so they just told him it would be one o'clock in about fifteen minutes, and so he must go home. He must go right away. But it didn't do no good. He cussed away with all his might and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it. And pretty soon he went a-raging down the street again with his gray hair flying. Everybody that could get a chance tried their best to coax him off his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober. But it weren't no use. Up the street he would tear again and give Shepard another cussing. By and by somebody says, Go for his daughter. Quick, go for his daughter. Sometimes they listen to her. If anybody can persuade him, she can. So somebody started on the run. I walked down the street a ways and stopped. In about five or ten minutes, here comes Boggs again. But not on his horse. He was a-reeling across the street, towards me, bareheaded, with a friend on both sides of him, a hold of his arms, and hurrying him along. He was quiet and looked uneasy and weren't himself. And he weren't hanging back any, but he was doing some of the hurrying himself. Somebody sings out, Boggs! I looked over there to see who it was, and it was that Colonel Shepherd. He was standing perfectly still in the street, and had a pistol raised in his right hand, not aiming it, but holding it out with the barrel tilted up towards the sky. The same second, I see a young girl coming on the run, and two men with her. Boggs and the men turned round to see who called him, and then they see the pistol, and the men jumped to one side, and the pistol barrel come down, slow and steady, to a level. Both barrels cocked. Boggs throws up both his hands and says, Oh, Lord, don't shoot. Bang! goes the first shot, and he staggers back, clawing at the air. Bang! goes the second one, and he tumbles backwards to the ground, heavy and solid, with his arms spread out. That young girl screamed out and comes rushing, and down she throws herself on her father, crying and saying, Oh, he's killed him! He's killed him! The crowd closed up around them and shouldered and jammered one another with their necks stretched, trying to see, and people on the inside trying to shove them back and shouting, Back! Back! Give him air! Give him air! Colonel Shevern, he tossed his pistol onto the ground and turned around on his heels and walked off. And they took Box to a little drugstore. The crowd was pressing around just the same, and the whole town following. And I rushed and got a good place at the window where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor and put one large Bible under his head and opened another one and spread it out on his breast. But they tore open his shirt first, and I see where one of the bullets went in. He made about a dozen long gasps, his breast lifting the Bible up when he drawed in his breath and letting it down again when he breathed it out. And after that, he laid still. He was dead. And then they pulled his daughter away from him, screaming and crying, and took her off. She was about sixteen, and very sweet and gentle looking, but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there, squirming and scrouging and pushing and shoving to get at the window and have a look. But people that had places wouldn't give them up and the folks behind them were saying all the time, Say now, you've looked enough, you fellas. Tain't right, and tain't fair for you to stay there all the time and never give nobody a chance. Other folks has their rights as well as you. There was considerable drawing back, so I stood out, thinking maybe there was going to be trouble. The streets was full, and everybody was excited. Everybody that seen the shooting was telling how it happened, and how there was a big crowd packed around each one of the fellas, stretching their necks and listening. One lanky man with long hair and big white fur stove pipe hat on the back of his head and a crooked handle cane marked out the places on the ground where Bog stood and where Sherburn stood, and the people following him round from one place to t'other watching everything he'd done and bobbing their heads to show they understood and stooping a little and resting their hands on their thighs to watch him mark the places on the ground with his cane. And then he stood straight up and stiff where Sherburn had stood, frowning and having his hat brim down over his eyes and sung out, Bogs! and then fetched his cane down, slow, to a dead level, and says, BANG! 
staggered backwards, says bang again, and fell down flat on his back. The people that had seen the thing said he'd done it perfect, said it was just exactly the way it had happened. Then, as much as a dozen people got out their bottles and treated him. Well, by and by, somebody said Sherbin ought to be lynched. In about a minute, everybody was saying it. So away they went, mad and yelling, and snatched down every clothesline they come to to do the hanging with. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share, relax, jazz. And if you really enjoyed, do subscribe because there's more to come. And if you're listening on podcasts, please leave a review. It is the easiest way to help get this in front of as many people as possible. And reading your reviews really makes my day. If you want to support the show in a more concrete means, you can join the channel here on YouTube or you can join the podcast on the in the first link of the description for the podcast, which would be fantastic. I did... I mean, I knew that it was written, you know, when lynchings was a thing, but I didn't expect that there would be a lynching in the book, and I'm really not looking forward to the next chapter. Um, God. If you're looking forward to it, or if you just want to see how this escapade finishes, I'm going to have to read it, so please feel free to listen in a couple of days. Once again, thank you very much for listening, and until next time, bye-bye.